We all know that melanoma is complex. From early to advanced disease, multidisciplinary teams are best suited to guide you through your melanoma journey. Today, to give us a better, more complete picture, we've brought together Henson Zhao, a dermatologist, Danielle Bello, a surgical oncologist, and Ladavia Maria, a medical oncologist, to take us alongside them through two hypothetical patient journeys. And while no two journeys are ever the same, we hope that the experience and insight shared by our expert panel, as well as your own con contributions and questions, will help shed some light into the complexities of a melanoma journey from diagnosis, treatment, and beyond. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Joe. Okay. Uh, so throughout this session, you're going to be reading and learning about our patient, Joe. Uh, there are some scenarios that you'll see on the screen and our, our panel will, will interact and, and, and discuss how they would come together as a multidisciplinary team to, uh, to manage this patient's care. So just to kick us off, and then I'm going to sit back down and, and leave it to our panel, but uh, Joe has a family history of melanoma and wasn't always great with sun safety until he was well into his 20s. However, he has been great with seeing a dermatologist for the last uh, decade or so, and, and although his routine has been disrupted by COVID-19, um, is really hoping to get back on track. So that's our backstory. And our first scenario is Joe's partner notices a lesion on his back. Uh, they've never seen it before and, and they alert him, hey, something's up, you should get this checked out. So Joe makes an appointment with his dermatologist, Dr. Zhao. Uh, he also snaps a quick photo of his lesion and sends it to Dr. Zhao through the patient portal. A week later, Joe is in Dr. Zhao's office for an exam. Dr. Zhao examines Joe's skin and biopsies the lesion. The biopsy results come back a week later. It is a confirmed melanoma, and you can see the picture uh, of, the, of the lesion on his back uh, on the screen. It was a uh, borderline for thickness, a 0.7 or 0.8 millimeter, and it was staged as 1A melanoma. Okay, so um, we've sort of framed the case in a couple questions that I'll go through, and I just wanna say, yes, every one of my patients looks like a model. And, and, and that's, a, that's a blessed practice. No, but um, the first question was, do I have any tips or getting in to see a dermatologist sooner or later? Chances are if you call up, they'll be like, hey, sure, I'll see you next July. So a couple things. First of all, call Dave Polsky. He'll see anyone within 24 hours, no matter where you live. <laughs> Short of that, <laughs> it kind of depends on whether you're a new or established patient. So most practices have urgent access clinics. So in this case, Joe is a... Uh, member of a practice. So usually if you say I have a changing spot, if I have melanoma, I'm worried about something, we can sneak someone in within the week or two, all right? So most practices have that capability. Um, if you have not had a melanoma, it's probably a good idea to meet one, uh, meet a dermatologist, not a melanoma. And uh, especially if you have higher sort of risk factors, such as a family history, if you had a lot of atypical moles removed, prior non-melanoma skin cancers, and that way you get to know the practice, you get to know the dermatologist, and when you call, they'll say, sure, sure, come on in um, as soon as you can. Now, one thing for new patients that I tip um, uh, individuals with is work through your PCP. Believe it or not, if your PCP belongs to a network that has a good collection of dermatologists, often they have sort of secret pathway they can kind of get you in. They'll say, Henson, listen, I'm really worried about this one. Do you mind if we sort of uh, sneak them in in a week rather than a month. So work through your PCP, it generally works. I think if you call up front at the desk and say I'm a new patient and I would just like to be seen, it's intimidating sometimes the number of months you have to wait. So I would say so as a bottom line, the best advice is to connect to a dermatologist. Um, you, know, you, ha you don't have to do it at age 18 per se, but as you approach the fourth or fifth decade, uh, just get a baseline exam, make sure your risk factors are sort of uh, in order, and that way they also sort of get to know you. Now, a couple of things that uh, Cody wanted to know about as sort of the second theme of this, uh, uh, Joe, is the ABCDEs of melanoma. Any tips for mucosal and acromelanoma? And this comes sort of down to what we think they look like. So for a traditional melanoma, I'll be honest with you, the ABCDE, the asymmetry, border, color, diameter, and evolution, 
Um, the evolution part is really important. A lot of atypical moles will fit A, B, C, D, all right? So two things we use as dermatologists, I'll share with you, this is like Durham's top secrets now, right? Um, <laughs> one is change. Change is very important. In my experience, most moles pop up at some point and they kind of stay put. So if you look at a mole in the back of your hand, you're like, wow, I haven't noticed that before. But 10 years from now, it's still kind of sitting there not doing anything. Uh, melanomas will evolve over time. And you'll notice in a month or two months that it's a little bit bigger or a little bit darker or just a slight raised bump. So that evolution and change is important. And the other one we use is something um, called the ugly duckling sign. This is when you look in the sky and you see the moon and that moon is clearly different than the background stars. Uh, sort of like that when we look at the, uh, someone's back. They may have 500 moles, but there's something that really stands out. It's the outlier. So those two strategies really inform me because if I had to sort of do an ABCD meter to everyone with an atypical mole, almost every mole will fit. So the sensitivity is a little too much for that. In terms of oral melanomas, because I do want to get to some of these um, uh, rare melanomas, it usually happens at the top of the mouth, all right? If you look at the distribution, it's often, again, on the roof of the mouth. Um, tons of people have what's called amalgam tattoos on the sides. In, the ch in their cheeks, and those are silver fillings that tattoo the sides of your mouth. So when you see that, a lot of people get scared, but often you'll find a little silver filling next to it, and that's what happens over years. You tattoo some silver into the side of your mouth. Um, anal melanomas, mucosa type, are very rare. They usually present like a hemorrhoid. Unfortunately, there's a lot more hemorrhoids in this country and that's not to be taken in, in a pejorative sense, uh, then there are anal melanomas. But certainly if things are bleeding and certainly when you're with your uh, primary care doctor, if you think there's something unusual about a growth, uh, definitely get that area checked out. Remember acral melanomas. Now we're talking palms and soles here. Uh, it's, it's not limited to darker skinned individuals, even though that is the predominant variant in darker skinned individuals. Most of my patients with acromelanomas are still European. And um, look at the bottom of your feet. Look at, uh, you're gonna see your palms every day. I don't think you need to necessarily focus on that. But in between the toes is a big one. Uh, most people look at the bottom of the feet, but they don't kind of spread out the toes. So make sure you look between the toes. <coughs> the palmar melanomas are even rarer than the uh, plantar ones than ones on the feet. Uh, and the biggest simulant, I think, for toenail melanoma, which can happen underneath the uh, nail plate, is hemorrhage. Uh, we'll get called probably once a week or a couple times a month, someone saying, I think I have a melanoma underneath my nail plate. And the question I usually ask is, did you wake up with it one day? And they say, yes, I woke up today and I saw this melanoma. Melanomas don't grow to that size overnight. That's usually hemorrhage. 99.9% .9 of the time they come in, it's hemorrhage. And often you'll be able to elicit a history of new shoes, walking, running, and you can be reassuring that most of those things are hemorrhage. But nevertheless, nevertheless, if you see something odd in the toenail somewhere, then definitely speak to a dermatologist. So do you wanna do the slides now as we're talking about uh, melanomas? I got a little quiz for you guys, all right? Because you'll get a sense of what these things may really look like. So we can call up the screen. So I wanna test your sort of melanoma detecting kung fu here, all right? If they've loaded the slide. So, each of you have been given two audience response monitors, or ARMs. You have a right and left one. So <laughs> when I actually ask a question, just raise your hand, all right? So for, for white belt kung fu, which one is the melanoma? How many say one? How many say two? All right, let's see the question. Let's see the answer. Yes, next one. Yellow belt now. This is the acromelanoma we're sort of talking about. How many say one? How many say two? All right, and the answer is one. Number two is hemorrhage. It's called a talon noir. This often happens after the Boston Marathon and after a long run, you get a little bleeding at the heel from friction. Talon noir, that shows up overnight. The other one takes years to kind of form. Next one. Orange belt, we've got four lesions down the side of this gentleman's armpit, one, two, three, four. How many think one is the melanoma? Two, three, 
three, a couple four. All right, let's see the answer. Excellent, look at, you could be working for me at this point. <laughs> I could just like take the weekends off. Here, next one please. Blue belt. How many think one? Got one, two in the back. How many think two? All right, and the answer? Yes, number two. It's not as crusty. Really, really crusty things that patients despise cosmetically is generally not melanoma, but seborrheic keratosis. All right, so the thing on the left is the seborrheic keratosis. Next, oh, this was hard. All right, one of them is a melanoma metastasis to the skin. How many think one? How many think two? Pretty even split, and the answer is one. The one on the right is called a cherry angioma. Dermatologists are very clever in naming things because it looks like a cherry, so, so it's called a cherry angioma. Um, but remember, things to the skin can be red. They don't have to be uh, dark brown or blue in any way, all right? Next one, please. Get into the black belt. This is a patient, a single patient with multiple atypical molds in the back. I'm just gonna run through the numbers and you tell me which one you think is a melanoma. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the answer is one. Just, just watch Susan Sweater. She's like the most brilliant dermatologist out there alive. So wh whenever she raises her hand, just like raise your hand, all right? So next. <laughs> okay, so now we're getting the black belt. No, this is not easy anymore with a gold stripe, all right? Four pink spots. One of them's a melanoma. See how hard it begins to get? How many think one? How many think A? How many think B? How many think C? And how many think D? And the answer is C. That's right. All melanomas come with a Sharpie drawn circle around it that <laughs> labeled A. So as long as they come in with an A, then usually I biopsy it and this one happened to be a melanoma. And, and next one, please. Black belt with red stripes. So this is hard. <laughs> this is really hard. Um, how many think A? How many think B? How many think C? And how many think D? And the answer is D. All right. So. These are rare. Um, I don't want you to think that every bump on you on the back is a melanoma, which was not my purpose to scare you today, but regardless, in the range of things we see, most melanomas are pretty classic, but there is a dynamic, again, spectrum of lesions. All right, so um, the other thing, Cody really wants to know what happens during a typical skin exam. Well, that's kind of private, but I'll share with you <laughs> what happens during a typical skin exam. Anyways. Um, I always start with the feet and toes because I tend to forget those if I don't start there. So it's got to be a head and toe analysis. It can't just kind of be, you know, half the back or one leg kind of thing. There's no prescribed length of time you need to do a skin exam. If a patient has one mole on the back, it, it's very quick. If they have 500, it's very long. I, I've had patients tell me they felt the exam was cursory and was very unhappy. I, I'll just tell you. I can't stare at a patient's tattoo for 10 minutes if they have no moles. There's just not much to do there. So it just depends on how complex your, your skin is. Um, couple tips, scalp is important. Although melanomas in the scalp are rare, the patients are never able to pick those up. So, you know, when you're there, ask your doctor to have your scalp examined. Um, don't be surprised if your hair cutter actually picks something up. That does happen. It's like, oh, there's some spot in the back of your skin. You probably didn't know about it. For certain reasons that are unclear, many scalp moles are bumpy. So many of you probably know about moles in your, so you can sort of point those things out when you're at the doctor. Mouth is also important. Um, and freckles on the lip are also quite common. Usually the lower lip because the ultraviolet to the lower lip is more intense than the upper lip. So those things do happen. So I always check the lips and the mouth, even though I've never found a fresh oral melanoma in my uh, time overall. Um, and then the question of genitals come up. Usually I'll do a male genital exam and uh, have the gyne uh, gynecologist do the female one unless there's a very specific spot that they want me to take a look at. And I would just say always make the doctor get a chaperone, which is a good practice if you're a woman in there and getting a um, genital exam. So uh, some tips with dermatologists when you're in there. Um, 
Don't write down 20 spots. There's no time for that. <laughs> All right, pick like a few that you're really worried about. And trust me, when they do a full exam, they'll look at every spot. Uh, we get distracted if there's too many little things sort of going on. Often wives will circle lesions for the husbands and almost every spot is kind of circled. Um, and then you just end up doing a full skin check anyways. And um, the other thing I do plenty is have a dermatologist take a picture of your mole on your phone at home. So they think, oh, there's one on the back I'm worried about. Just hand them the phone and have someone take a picture of it so you can track it sort of at home, all right? So for this patient, he comes back and the biopsy shows melanoma, uh, borderline thickness, stage 1A. Uh, David went into staging for melanoma, so I'm not gonna talk about it much, except the two things we really sort of look at is that thickness, which is kind of mathematically related to prognosis and ulceration which tends to, they believe at least, relate to maybe how fast the melanoma is growing and how it's sort of outstripped is uh, blood supply. So those are key determinants of stage. And the third one is microsatellites. Um, a lot of people confuse Clark levels with stage. That's something to be careful about. But the three really important things that we use, again, thickness, ulceration, it used to be mitotic rates, and microsatellites help us decide what stage the tumor is. All right. Um, and overall, there's nothing in pathology that specifies treatment of the primary melanoma itself, all right? Uh, so you don't look at a superficial spreading melanoma and go, we gotta give a BRAF inhibitor. It's really in the metastatic setting that it's important. So Joe has an early stage melanoma and sort of diagnosed as stage 1A um, in the parlance. Um, however, there's more surgery and potentially central nodes that need to happen. So this is what I would refer to. Thank you very much. So um, Joe will come to my office next and I will repeat some of what uh, Dr. Zhao did, um, do a thorough and complete history. Um, do you wanna go to this part of the scenario, Cody, or do you want me to just talk through the central node? So um, keep going. Okay, so I'm gonna keep going. So I will repeat a lot of what Dr. Zhao did. I will do a complete history and physical exam. So my physical exam is more focused on the biopsy site, making sure you can locate it. If a patient has numerous nevi, you know, some patients come in and have dysplastic nevus syndrome, they have greater than 100 atypical looking molds. I wanna make sure that the patient either comes with a photograph or there's some documentation the patient can readily identify the biopsy site for me if I cannot identify it clearly on exam. So that's the first thing. I wanna take a look at the skin around the biopsy site and make sure there's no nodularity, there's nothing concerning for what we call satellitosis um, or nodules, um, little deposits of melanoma within the subcutaneous tissue or skin around the biopsy site. Um, I will then perform a nodal exam. The axilla, the head and neck, and the inguinal region are the most easily accessible, but depending on where the melanoma is, if it's an apical melanoma on the bottom of your foot or the heel, you want to make sure to also feel the popliteal nodes, the lymph nodes behind the knee. If it's a melanoma on the palm or subungual on the fourth and fifth digit, you also want to feel the brachial or epitrochlear nodes in the um, medial arm and upper arm. So those are subtle things that you want to check for on exam depending on the anatomic location of the primary tumor. Um, a complete history. Um, including family history, personal history of skin cancers, other melanomas, things that we look for, a, a strong family history. Sometimes we'll consider sending a young patient also for genetic testing, um, as well as if the patient has a very strong history for malignancy. Um, so those are things that I typically look for when I see the patient, and then we enter into a discussion about treatment. So treatment consists of removing the primary tumor with a wide local excision, and we go by depth of melanoma. So for melanomas um, less than a millimeter in thickness, we, we excise melanomas with a one centimeter margin. For melanomas greater than two millimeters in thickness, we excise melanomas with a two, mil a two centimeter margin, and those between one to two, the standard is even, either one or two centimeters. A lot of it depends on um, anatomic site and if you're able to do um, a two centimeter margin versus a one centimeter margin. Um, 
We then discussed sentinel lymph node biopsy, and sentinel lymph node biopsy just to discuss is localizing the draining lymph nodes for that area of skin on the body. So how we do that is we inject dye on the day of surgery, um, and we take radiographs that show melanomas, uh, the lymph nodes that light up with the dye, and those are the lymph nodes we remove to check if melanoma has metastasized to the lymph nodes. And the decision of whether or not to perform a lymph node biopsy is really risk-based. So the things that we use to prognosticate or um, assess a patient's risk, uh, we've touched on briefly, but it's really thickness and ulceration. So for melanomas greater than a millimeter in thickness, we have the MSLT1 trial that showed for intermediate thickness melanomas, one to four millimeters in thickness, sentinel node biopsy is the most prognostic tool to detect how patients will do their likelihood of recurrence and uh, their survival. So it correlates for patients with intermediate thickness. So we routinely perform for healthy patients who can undergo anesthesia, sentinel node biopsy for melanomas one to four millimeters in thickness. We do consider it for thick primary melanomas. Um, we do use it to prognosticate patients who are stage 2B versus or NC versus stage three C and D if the sentinel node would be positive and whether or not it factors into a discussion of whether or not you consider giving patients adjuvant therapy. The borderline cases are cases like Joe. Joe has a melanoma in the 0.8 to 0.9 range. So generally for early or thin melanomas, those that are 0.7 millimeters and below with low risk features, no ulceration, um, we generally do a wide excision alone with a one centimeter margin. The reason being for very large, in very large numbers of patients, we know the overall risk for melanomas of the, that thickness, 0 0.1 to 0.7, the risk of sentinel lymph node metastases is less than 5%. For patients who have a thickness of 0.8 and 0.9 based on the new staging system, we know their general risk of sentinel lymph node metastases is around 7%. So the overall complication rate for sentinel lymph node biopsy is about 5% for all comers. So you're right where the risks and the benefits of getting that prognostic information and having a complication of surgery meet. So for that, for those melanomas, those that are T1B, our current oncologic guidelines say to consider the lymph node biopsy. For young, healthy patients, those who can undergo general anesthesia, we generally consider doing it because we think that prognostic information will better help stage the patient as truly a stage 1A or a stage 3A or, um, and give us further information on how to follow those patients with imaging and so forth. Um, there are exceptions to the very thin melanomas. So very thin melanomas, those less than 0.7, um, in young patients, in patients who have mitoses, in patients who have ulceration, who, in rare patients who have lymphovascular invasion, that's where I think a little more thought and consideration is, needs to be taken into account. There are numerous prognostic models that have been developed. Um, there's a very large sentinel node biopsy calculator from the Melanoma Institute of Australia. There's ones from Sloan Kettering. There's ones, I believe, also from MD Anderson. So, and each prognostic model uses different clinical and pathologic features for patients. So it takes into account gender, age, mitoses, thickness, ulceration. Not each model uses the same criteria. So you could have a sentinel node biopsy positivity rate of 20% based on one of the models and 3% based on another model. So there is a wide range, none of them are perfect, but if they have an unusual feature and it's an earlier thin melanoma, that will give me pause. Um, because in general, you know, early stage 0 0.3, 0 0.4 millimeter melanomas are rarely ulcerated. They rarely have a higher mitotic index where there are are cells in the dermal layer that are in mitoses. Um, so in those cases, I do plug in these pathologic features into a nomogram and tend to use those in discussing with the patients whether or not to do a central node biopsy because I think it, it offers a little bit more clarity and information that's specific to that patient. 
So those are some of the things that I talk about in considering a central node biopsy. Um, and then um, I do explain the procedure a little more in detail. And usually in terms of timing when the patient comes to see me, generally I like to see the patient as quickly as possible. Ideally, we know that the wait time for patients is often anxiety provoking. Nobody wants, once you have a diagnosis of melanoma, to then wait to go to meet the surgeon and then wait to have your surgery scheduled. So in general, um, I try and get people into the office within one to two weeks and then try and schedule surgery within two weeks of, of that time. Patholo pathology turnaround time, which we talk about patients with patients ahead of time to kind of set the expectation, is usually about two weeks later. So all of that, um, you know, is about six weeks. And then depending on the results, um, if Joe had a positive node, I would then uh, refer him to our medical oncologist for further discussion. Me? Okay, great. Yay. So, hi. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Sow. I, I just wanted to say that your presentation reaffirmed why I went into medical oncology because I, I did very bad on that dermatology exam there. So, um, so yeah, thank you, Dr. Bellow. So, you know, there's a, a couple things that I think of as a medical oncologist when I'm meeting a, a person um, for the first time. Obviously, stage is, is really important. So it used to be that really we were pretty selective and really would only see patients with... Uh, you know, stage three disease, people that had lymph node involvement or satellites, that's now different. So we now have a, a recent FDA approval of a medical therapy in the post-operative setting for people with uh, stage two disease, basically means thick uh, primary melanoma, um, uh, also with ulceration. Those, those stage two patients often have worse risk than, than people in the stage three A category. And so those patients have been largely um, just not having any good uh, adjuvant therapy options. And, and so finally there was a clinical trial called the Keynote 716, and now there's an FDA approval for a new medication. Now, you know, I think it's important that when we, you know, although these medications are available, there's a very individualized discussion that you have with the patient. You want to look at them as a whole, you know, age, how, you know, other medical issues, um, um, and, and also obviously the melanoma features as well. Uh, even though the medication is available, it, it still should be a very detailed, individualized discussion with the patient to see if that medication really makes sense um, to, to administer or not. And especially in an inpatient, uh, when you're giving it in the post-operative setting, really using it as a preventative, you have to really be cautious that, remember, this patient population is potentially cured. So me giving medication, well, they're still going to be cured whether they get that medicine or not. So we have to really... Uh, be very um, careful about making sure that the risk of the melanoma uh, is high enough that it warrants the potential risk of any kind of medication. So let me maybe go back to Joe um, and, and just uh, go back to his case. So he has his melanoma, he has his surgery, his sentinel node, go, go back, uh, sorry. Um, I was just trying to, yeah, go back. Uh, so he has a surgery and, and everything's great. Uh, sentinel node will say it was negative and he continues just with, um, you know, doubling down on his son's safety, um, increases his visits with Dr. Sao, uh, becomes better at, uh, you know, checking his skin. However, uh, you know, COVID-19 uh, develops, pandemic, um, and uh, he is, um, you know, it's not getting out too much. Um, and uh, he sort of unfortunately um, uh, slacks off on his medical care. Um, and um, so to the next slide, uh, we see that um, he develops some symptoms, unfortunately, develops some pains in his abdomen, finally goes to the doctor. Uh, they do some basic uh, workup, can't really figure it out, and eventually end up getting a CT scan. Uh, and, and now it looks like he has uh, potentially some spots in the liver and lymph nodes. Um, and so uh, has some blood work showing that elevated LDH that Dr. Polsky mentioned, has a biopsy of a lesion near the liver and um, uh, diagnosis of melanoma, and he does have what's the, the BRAF mutation that we heard about earlier. So now we have uh, poor Joe going from early stage disease um, to, to metastatic disease. So anytime we have melanoma that's left the skin, 
you know, and gone beyond the regional lymph node bed and has gone into an organ that's basically metastatic, traveling through the bloodstream, and, and that's stage four metastatic disease. So again, same scenario when I'm meeting um, Joe in this situation, there are things that I want to focus on. Again, I want to focus on him, his general health, his support, the support he has at home or doesn't have at home, that's, that's critically important. And then I want to look at his disease factors. So anytime a patient has a symptom from a melanoma, I get nervous. We don't want our patients to have symptoms. Uh, that means that really ups the ante in terms of the aggressiveness of the cancer. As we heard earlier, LDH elevations are never a good thing. It, it tends to indicate that the melanoma is pretty advanced. Um, it's uh, perhaps been growing for a while, and, and um, we know, unfortunately, that a lot of people with LDH, the outcomes just aren't as good uh, as people with normal LDH. So that's those, that symptomatic disease is important. And then also additional disease factors. So, um, you know, um, doing an MRI of the brain is very important. Unfortunately, we know that melanoma has a, a predilection to go to the brain. Um, and, and so having that done, um, just like you would have a CAT scan or a PET scan, having a dedicated um, brain imaging study is very, very important to complete the staging. And then having the tumor mutation analysis is also a really important tool for me uh, and, and for all of us when we're making some, some decisions. So, you know, generally when I approach this discussion, I tell my patients there's really three kinds of medicine options in melanoma. There's chemotherapy, which really nobody uses, terribly unsexy in this, you know, modern era that we're in. Uh, but, you know, it is an option uh, sometimes when we have nothing else, um, but not really something that we use with, um, you know, with uh, certainly not in the first line setting. We do have targeted therapy, so having a BRAF mutation um, is really important, but there are more mutations that we need to look at beyond BRAF. Certainly BRAF is the most common in cutaneous melanomas, uh, but looking for kit mutations, which are in some kinds of cutaneous melanomas, also in acral and mucosal melanomas, and NRAS mutations. That's another really key factor because although there's nothing FDA approved for NRAS mutations, there's a lot of clinical trials and, and research being done um, in that avenue. So tumor mutation analysis is, is really important. But anyway, so um, say we know that Joe has a BRAF mutation, that's great to know. But we, you know, for a while debated amongst ourselves, um, you know, if a patient has a BRAF mutation, should we give them BRAF and, and MEK inhibitor? Should we give them those, those targeted therapies or should we do immunotherapy? And we would debate and argue and, and didn't really have a lot of clear data until again, pretty recently, a really important clinical trial was um, uh, presented um, called the D Dream Seek trial. And this is basically a, a study that you'll probably hear about later in more detail. But the bottom line, this was treatment naive uh, metastatic melanoma patients with BRAF mutations. And half of them uh, got upfront BRAF MEC and then went to immunotherapy um, if the BRAF MEC stopped working. And the other half got upfront immunotherapy and then moved to BRAF MEC if the immunotherapy stopped working. So basically, questions of, of answering, you know, what's the best sequence? And what we found very clearly is that the patients who get the immunotherapy upfront do much better in terms of overall survival. And that's what we're in this for, right? We're not here to help you for a few weeks or months, right? We're trying to make us all grow old together, right? That's, that's the goal of, of every interaction. So, um, um, so we have clear data that immunotherapy uh, upfront uh, t is associated with better prognosis, even if you have a BRAF mutation. So I'm not sure if there's another slide or not, but okay. So, you know, that's how I would approach this. I would generally go for um, an immunotherapy based approach. Um, the next question that comes to mind is, you know, in this scenario, do we do a single drug? Do we do single agent anti PD1 antibody? Or is this a situation where we need maybe two drugs together, the IPI and the NEVO combination, or clinical trials, uh, obviously? So I'm always going to say, you know, as an academic oncologist, that clinical trials are the way to go. So I always encourage um, patients to ask about clinical trials to try to research clinical trials uh, because there could be something, you know, potentially paradigm shifting out there. Uh, and so, um, you know, clinical trials are, are an excellent uh, so solution uh, option, you know, both in the treatment naive setting as well as in people that have had prior immunotherapy or other therapies and looking for another option. 
Um, but going back to the conversation of single agent versus dual agent, again, not clear um, uh, guidelines one way or the other, but my general school of thought is that if a patient is symptomatic, so we know Joe has abdominal pain, we also know he has elevated LDH, those are, you know, th those are my warning bells that are going off. This patient probably has pretty aggressive disease, and in that scenario, I would favor a more aggressive approach with uh, either an aggressive clinical trial or, or dual um, agent uh, combination immunotherapy. So there are some situations, uh, just to bring Dr. Bellow back in, you know, there are definitely some situations, you know, even in metastatic disease where we really rely heavily um, you know, on surgeons. And, and so, you know, you could imagine a situation where, say, Joe or whoever has a, a deposit of melanoma in their colon. And the way we figure this out is because it's having bleeding. Uh, and, and, you know, that's, that's something that really we worry about uh, quite a bit. Um, and, and in a situation like this, you know, I might refer this patient to Dr. Bellow as a surgeon to talk about the risks and benefits of doing surgery um, in, in the setting of, of metastatic disease. So yes, there's, a, there's definitely scenarios in, in stage four and unresectable stage three disease that we consider doing surgery for. One of them, as we talked about, is, is palliation. So bleeding, pain, um, and relief of symptoms are, are, um, are a reason to do local therapy, even radiation, surgical resection, um, things to remove the tumor that's causing pain. Um, another reason is for uh, to to assess the pathology um, and the patient's response to therapy. In some scenarios, you can't always tell um, what the responding tumor is doing on PET scan um, because of the inf inflammation that may be occurring due to the immune response. So in those cases, we do go in and, and resect the tumor and we get a little bit more information. Dr. Uh, Amaria has pioneered uh, and published extensively on neoadjuvant therapy for patients with advanced stage three and stage four disease. So giving um, immunotherapy upfront um, and then taking patients for resection and, and we've actually gained a lot of insight and information on uh, how patients respond by analyzing their tumors once they're taken out. So there's definitely a synergy between medical oncology and surgical oncology and dermatology as well. Um, I think having a team where you all communicate clearly and discuss patients, discuss their cases, discuss, discuss how they're responding to therapy and what, you know, what the goal is um, both for systemic treatment and local treatment with surgery, I think is important to consider. Wow, and uh, Dr. Bello, you perfectly summed up the end of the, the presentation yeah. here. Uh, we now wanna open the floor to questions, and, and, and prior to doing that, I just wanna thank our panelists again. This session in particular, <laughs> thank you. This session in particular is something we've been very interested in doing for some time, but we knew it would take um, some special uh, special people to help us do it in a way that, that would make it uh, really insightful. So again, thank you so much for, for your willingness and, and the, a lot of prep that went into it. Does anyone have any questions for our, our, our panel? Hi. I'm a mucosal patient. Um, we have a patient Facebook group that's pretty active. I had a couple quick questions real fast. For the dermatology side. Uh, I don't have a microphone. That's okay. <laughs> uh, at, at, oh, geez, that's, that's perfect. <laughs> um, my dentist was really proactive in working with me even though I'm mucosal melanoma. Um, and he has, since my diagnosis, went out of his way to buy the alternate light source scope. How, I mean, is there a measure of inaccuracy in those? Do they sometimes not fluoresce right if it's an amelanotic oral cancer? Or? Yeah, I think all these sort of optical devices, um, you really have to think about, just in general technology, what prospective trials have sort of uh, gone out there. In general, the, um, you can see the pigments in the oral mucosa. I'm not so sure that the fluorescence adds that much more to it. And in general, if you sort of know the differential diagnoses, you can usually rule out 
mucosal melanomas too, like the amalgam tattoo that I sort of- Six, six biopsies for those before my original surgery. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I think from our perspective, we tend not to use any sort of fancy technologies in the oral mucosa. The dentist may sort of be more comfortable using those devices. But again, when we sort of look in there, we really look at the location, we look at sort of um, other sort of mitigating factors like fillings, and then we look at, uh, again, growth. You can take a picture sometimes and see what's going on. So, you know, overall, it's more of a clinical approach for us. And for Dr. Bello, real quickly, can you talk about the staging difficulties for mucosal I it seems like they're all over the clock and very subjective from doctor to doctor involved. Uh, and every one of us here, I mean, I was considered stage four on diagnosis, even though it was relatively small. Uh, now it's uh, 12 years later, um, NED for long term. <laughs> but the staging issue continues and uh, that's right up your alley, so if you would. I do think it's I do think it, it's difficult to extrapolate from the mucosal melanomas to a cutaneous or and and even acral, um, you know, extrapolating from that to the cutaneous melanoma staging system because a lot of times, mucosal melanomas, if they're in the anal, you know, the anal genital skin, they don't necessarily have nodal staging performed at the same time, so you don't necessarily know the nodal stage. They could have microscopic disease present, you wouldn't know. Um, same thing for a uveal or, you know, an, an oral mucosal. So um, we rely heavily on imaging. We know that's an imperfect, um, an imperfect way to stage someone uh, with melanoma. So I think more work definitely needs to be done for mucosal melanoma. Yeah, I, I, would, I would say if they were diagnosing me today, they wouldn't call me stage four anymore because I had no distant disease. Right. It was just a localized, it had finally broken encapsulation, but it, it, it still is extremely variable as we get new patients in every week. We, it's all over the place still. So it's an area that really needs improvement on the mucosal side. And, and just to piggyback on that, I, I completely agree. I, I struggle. I've kind of made my own staging system um, to, to make it clear in my mind because we, we do have a lot of mucosal patients. And I wanted to just say that a forum like this is absolutely critical to talk about these rare melanoma subtypes. Mucosal melanoma is super underrepresented. There's a bunch of sponsors and drug companies in this audience. Please consider mucosal melanoma trials. Um, there are absolutely patients for this. Um, and, and the only way we're going to clear up these issues with even as something as simple as staging is by actually doing dedicated research in this group of, of patients. Well, I, I'm going to go ahead and jump the gun and pitch that. That's what the rare registry is about. We're all patient advisors in the rare registry. We're all mucosal melanoma patients or caregivers. And uh, we're hoping we're gonna be able to deliver 100 plus living patients and records on 50 or 100 more along with our acral fellows or part of that too. But we, we need to make a difference in those rare melanomas. Do we have other questions over? Um, I, actually, I just have one brief question. So you don't always have imaging. So my uh, nasal polyp was not colored in any way. It was, it was skin colored. And my doctor was absolutely convinced, not cancer, just a polyp. He removed the polyp, never got an image. I never got an image. There was no image for my oncologist to basically do the staging. They did the staging just based on the fact that, they, I guess they, they made it stage three because there was no met metastatic disease. But no discussion about ulceration, nothing, right? So I have absolutely no idea how accurate my staging is. It's very hard to know, right? And, and so I don't know whether there should be medical practices when people are taking polyps out just in case. I don't know. There, I, I think there should be imaging if that's what you're relying on. Hi, um, I have a question when you were talking about looking at the different mutations in terms of coming up with the therapy uh, treatment regimens. Um, I'm one of six kids. Um, five of us have had melanoma. Um, we have a, a germline BAP1 mutation, which I understand is extremely rare. And I can't seem to find, there's, 
BAP1 is associated with melanomas, but also other cancers too. And one of them is mesothelioma. So for instance, I've, I've found a number of studies on mesothelioma, which one of my siblings has. Um, but I can't find anything about studies or information about BAP1 treatments that would, is, would um, address the BAP1 mutation or any, you know, how do you take a mutation that, from what I understand so far, has only been identified with maybe 100 or so families? Um, how, how do you get attention to that and find out whether there's anything that we can do other than just constantly go to the dermatologist, which is what we all do? <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to tackle that first. We have a bunch of BAP1 families because we sort of had a research interest early in it. In terms of the skin findings, there are these small sort of pinkish little bumps. I mean, affectionately known as BAPOMAs, but what it is is really just kind of a atypical mole, if you will, that lacks BAP1. When we first saw these, they were so atypical looking. My first patient with a germline BAP1 had 11 melanomas diagnosed, and looking back, they were all these BAPOMAs, quote unquote. They do get cutaneous melanomas for real, and obviously all these other cancers you sort of talk about. Um, in uveal melanomas, loss of BAP1 is associated with a much more aggressive pathology. We don't think that's the case in cutaneous melanomas. And these BAPOMAs, I think at this point, are more sort of uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. We don't think they're necessarily aggressive malignancies, but more just very odd looking sort of moles. The other things that are not recognized as much is they get early onset basal cell skin cancers, in my experience. Um, so, you know, engaging, once I have someone with a BAPOMA quote unquote diagnosed at an early age, I always get a family history and just having one sporadic one doesn't mean that much, but once you start getting multiple and then more and more family members sort of show up with these kind of BAP syndrome tumors, then germline diagnosis is obviously important. Um, I don't know if the oncology people use the BAP1 tumor status in decisions about treatment but certainly we use it, the germline genetic testing thing that you talk about in guiding us in terms of um, how often we see the patients. So it's used for surveillance and obviously we partner with oncology to follow the mesotheliomas to screen, definitely ophthalmology to look for eye melanomas. Um, so, you know, kidney cancers, brain tumors, they all sort of occur in that, you know, tumor syndrome. Just was, you, you couldn't have asked a better person than Hudson Sow about the genetics of melanoma. He is just my high school classmate and an expert in melanoma genetics, including the germline mutations. Um, I applaud the work you're doing with the rare tumor registries. And just to let you know how valuable this is for vulvovaginal melanoma, which is also incredibly rare, very different than sinomucosal melanoma, we now understand that staging should be done as it is for cutaneous melanoma and not for the FIGO, the gynecologic oncology staging, which has previously been used, which tends to overestimate the stage. And so this is done, though, from retrospective data in a registry out of Australia several years ago that really suggests that the tumor behaves more akin to cutaneous melanoma staging in the eighth edition than FIGO staging. And that will now be a change in NCCN guidelines to follow AGCC staging rather than FIGO. So the rare tumor registries are critical and essential to really helping us to understand the, the outcomes and biologic behavior of these more rare subtypes. So I terrific work. That would be a thing because the, you're at that area where you're merging skin to mucosa. Right, and there's a difference between right. vaginal, proximal, and distal, which behaves more like vulvar. I mean, it's just we, we need the cases to really understand it. So just wanted to say that. Thank you. And I can say that Susan was not paid for that commercial, but we appreciate the pitch for registries. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Jamie Goldfarm. I'm a metastatic melanoma survivor and patient advocate. Survivor thanks to Till Therapy. Woo -woo, till th um, thank you very much for um, that wonderful presentation. It was very comprehensive and fantastic in content and delivery, so thank you. Um, I, my question is, how do we work together to normalize a fourth bucket of treatment options of clinical trials? How do we work together to 
start those conversations with the patient earlier in the process so that the first time they're not potentially hearing about a clinical trial, if they're lucky enough to hear about one at all, is when they're being diagnosed um, stage four or when they are stage four and have already gone through everything they can and the oncologist then, which happens very often, the oncologist who is not a research oncologist says, I'm sorry, I have nothing left for you without even any discussion of the fact that clinical trials exist. Um, and then they stumble on them themselves through their own research. So how can we, using this very wonderful integrated collaborative treatment pathway model that you've presented, how can we start from the beginning and work together to normalize clinical trials as a treatment option earlier? So I think it, it people have to know about the clinical trials from the time that you go to the dermatologist's office or the surgeon's office, not just when you go to the medical oncologist's office. So I think it's really important that there is that communication between all members of the tumor board. So if it's a melanoma tumor board at your hospital, there should be representatives of the dermatology service, the surgery service, the medical oncology service. Because when someone comes to me with a diagnosis of, of melanoma, and you have the opportunity to talk about something like neoadjuvant therapy or a neoadjuvant trial, it should be introduced early and at that time point if that is something that, you know, you think has the potential to greatly impact that person. It doesn't have to be the standard of care. You still want to discuss the standard of care with the patient, of course. But right now there's a surgical trial looking at different melanoma margins for early melanomas, one versus two centimeters. That gets introduced at the time of their visit and then, you know, patients have time to think about whether or not they want to participate prior to surgery. But I think early and often and then you refer them to your colleagues who can also discuss the trial. But I think if, if a patient comes to a physician and they don't know about the trials that are currently going on, it's a missed opportunity. Yeah, I think um, one thing, depending on where you go, we do have a multidisciplinary clinic where the surgeon is hanging with us. So if the surgical trial is happening, they're just consent the patients sort of there. So I think having some element of that um, multidimensional approach is good if there's no dialogue between the units. And we all come from hospitals, and many of the investigators out there are too, come from places where there is this comprehensive sort of care approach, and there the conversation happens a lot more, I think. So, you know, without pitching that you should go to a center with a melanoma unit, I think if you're worried, go to a center with a melanoma unit, because they're more in general in tune with things. The only other thing I would say is, you know, all three of us are, have the luxury of being in these centers where we have these trials available, but, but I, I understand that that's not the, the case for the majority of the community oncologists out there. What's important to note is that, uh, you know, cancer research occurs outside of these big centers. There are cooperative groups, uh, whether it's SWOG or ECOG or whatever, there are these various community centers Im embedded uh, in our community that do uh, try to engage in, in, in um, good research. And so sometimes trying to do some investigation and maybe finding one of those centers, if you don't have the luxury of being able to go to a big academic tertiary center, finding one of those centers that, that does have that kind of um, community oncology group perspective and trials available is, is also another option. I realize we're hitting time, so unless there's someone who's just going to knock me over to ask a question, I would prefer we just all put our hands together with a great applause and a wonderful panel. Thank you so much to the panel.